So more information on Joel here. So uh, Joel Hodge has a bachelor's in history and political science from Messiah University in Grantham, Pennsylvania, and a master's of arts in teaching from Eastern University's Templeton Honors College. And she began her career as a staffer to the United States Senator Erlen Specter before finding her professional home in the world of classical education in 1999. She has more than 20 years of classical education teaching experience. And she has co-authored two logic books, both The Art of Argu Argument, which we're here for today, An Introduction to the Informal Fallacies, and The Deduction Discovery of Deduction, An Introduction to Formal Logic, both published here by Classical Academic Press, and continues to support various editorial projects here at CAP. Her primary focus is on supporting the growth and development of Classical Academic Press in her role as the Vice President of Operations, Sales, and Marketing. And prior to her current VP role, Joelle has served as at CAP by helping to launch our online school, Scholae Academy, where she served as their director for several years. Um, so yeah, um, all yours. Hi, everyone. It's good to be back with you all again. <clears throat> uh, I, I give a webinar usually once a year, and um, it's always fun to get to um, talk about logic. I, since I'm not in the classroom quite as much anymore, um, it's 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 fun to kind of get back into and talk a, a little bit about uh, why it's so important, um, how it fits in with the other other um, curriculum that we're using, the other disciplines, um, and and even to talk a little bit about sort of uh, you know what um, what what are some of the challenges that we face when we try to implement logic into um, a classroom and into a school, um, just as a as important as it is, it it doesn't it sometimes doesn't fit just as easily as it might um, as we might wish it did with some of the other um, courses and things. So um, I've had a chance to give talks all along those lines in previous years, and we we have all of those recorded and everything. So if that would ever be helpful in sort of talking about where it sits within the liberal arts and within the trivium and sort of the philosophy of it and then the importance of it and some you know some very practical ideas about how to go about educating your students and your parents you know we have all of those webinars that we can we can share with you as well um, but today i wanted to take a, um, today's webinar is a much more practical um, and sometimes that's really good too um, but because we have a brand new um, edition of the Art of Argument and wanted to make sure that uh, everybody out there who's used the old one knows what to expect with the new one, knows what's similar, what's changed, all of those kinds of things. Um, so maybe maybe you've already received your copy and you've ordered it and now you're just wanting to kind of, you know, learn a little bit more about what, what you've got um, and perhaps you haven't ordered yet. Um, so, you know, this hopefully this will be helpful for everyone. And then um, and then we, I, I'm happy to take questions at the end as well, um, just, just as usual. So um, thank you again for coming and um, I'll go ahead and get started. So um, uh, I, I wanted to start with a little bit of a story of how the art of argument came to be in the first place <clears throat> so that you could kind of see the where we've been, where we are, where we're going kind of um, um, thought that we had a couple of months ago. So hopefully we've, we've arrived at this point, but um, uh, Megan mentioned that um, I've had more than you know 20 years of classroom experience, and I got thrown into the deep end, uh, like most classical educators do um, when they started teaching. So back in 1999, when I started teaching at a classical school here, Dr. Christopher Perrin, who many of you, you may recognize his name, he's one of the owners here at CAP, um, and, and gives so many great talks and things you probably remember him from a variety of places. He was the headmaster at the school where I where I had been hired. And um, he knew that I had some uh, philosophy background and political science and some other things. And so he thought she can teach our logic class to the seventh graders. And I said, just like most young um, young folks do when they are offered a job, they say, yes, I can, and I'll figure it out as I go. Um, and that's exactly what I did. So he invited me to uh, launch their logic class. It was a school, it was in their second year. So they were just kind of doing K through six. And then the second year they were adding a seventh grade. So there hadn't been a seventh grade yet. And he, um, <clears throat> he, uh, he gave me the curriculum, the only logic curriculum that we could find that was kind of aimed at kids that age. Um, and it's from a publisher that I, I won't name, um, but it, it was it was fine uh, for what it was. And, and everybody was just starting out trying to get resources to 
the you know to classical educators for for ki for kids um and I took that curriculum and I went home and I poured over it all summer long, maybe what you're doing with your logic curriculum this year. Um, and I started thinking through, well, gosh, you know, this is it's it's got a, it's got some good information there. But boy, you know, we it, it needs to be enhanced in some ways. And so I started thinking about what what could I do, you know, thinking pedagogically about what could we do differently that would really begin to use some of the classical pedagogical techniques that we like to use in classical education and not just providing them with good content. Um, that, that curriculum was the, um, I mean, factually correct. It wasn't that there was any, that there were, you know, any egregious errors in it or anything like that, but it just didn't have some of the accessibility, the pedagogical tools, the connection with students, you know, some of those kinds of things um, that I really wanted it to have. So, I started building out my and, and building around it for my in-class um, experience. And throughout that year, um, I, I talked with Chris um, regularly. You know, he was my supervisor. And so I talked with him all the time. Um, and I was telling him about some of the things that we were doing. And, and we started getting this idea that, you know what, um, you know, we we could probably do this ourselves, um, and maybe we could even do it better um, in some ways. Um, the, you know, the the informal fallacies. Um, are such that, you know, they, you know, there's, they are what they are, and you kind of build a curriculum around them, and you don't necessarily need just, you know, a specific text necessarily, unless that text does it really well. And so we thought, well, you know, if you're going to be adding so much to it, maybe, maybe it is worth it to go ahead and think about, let's start from scratch, and how would we really want to do it? So um, Chris and I and um, Aaron Larson got together um, and we were the uh, we decided to start Classical Academic Press. So the three of us um, were the original owners of Classical Academic Press, um, the three authors that you see on the on the book itself. Um, we and it was the Art of Argument and Latin for Children that we decided we were going to um, publish first. And because we knew that the same kind of questions were being asked about Latin, how can we do this a little bit differently? So. Um, the, the three of us started Latin for Children came out first and then Art of Argument um, was the second on order and Aaron and I were paired up for it and I, I went looking today for our original cover of the original Art of Argument book and it doesn't look anything like this current one. You, um, the original cover has like a a, um, a stone sculpture of it, of, you know, um, sort of someone thinking, it's not the David, but, you know, someone thinking, and, um, and it was, and, and, and very soon after that, we decided, let's, let's, let's make this even more accessible to kids. Um, we're not marketing it to adults, we're marketing it to kids, and so, we, you know, to trying to target the kids. So um, very, I think two years after the original cover came out, we we decided to go with something that was more like this cover. But this is the this is the brand new one that's been updated a little bit as well. Um, so uh, so what what we have here today is really kind of almost like the 20th anniversary edition of the original. And it's so it's taken um, we, we came out with it the first time um, and then we made some modifications to it. And Chris came on as a um, Aaron and I wrote the very first uh, book together. And then Chris came on as a collaborator. And I think he really helped to fill it out. And and, and Chris, if you if you've met Chris Perrin and, and had a chance to talk to him, you probably noticed that you know, he's, um, uh, he, he just knows how to think like a kid sometimes, you know, as brilliant as he is, sometimes he, he knows how to kind of bring it down and really think like a kid. Um, and so we started thinking about, um, uh, how we could, how we could, um, uh, really enhance the book that we had created. So, um, we kept going from there and, um, in 20, uh, 2002, we, we had that first version. And then I think in 2004, we had the enhanced version with Chris. And that's the one that really lasted all the way until now. So it's really been, you know, tr almost 20 years of the, the previous edition um, that we that we wanted to that we had we had been using. And over those 20 years, um, I have either been teaching students, not so much recently, but or teachers, um, and I've been uh, I've been leading teachers who have been teaching logic as well. And between using our art of argument text myself, and um, in talking with t educators uh, from across the country and the world, kind of gathered in a lot of things for if we ever do another edition, another update, what would we include? And that's what this latest version is is really some of the things that I thought we might have been missing from that. Um, 
from, from the art of argument that we've all come to know and love. So um, the first thing I want to kind of note for everybody is, before I tell you what's new, is that um, I we really have tried to preserve so much about it. There's a reason why the, the cover really hasn't changed too much, because we wanted to make sure that everybody knew um, this is not a book that's just radically different, that you're going to have to learn a brand new curriculum with or anything like that. I think we've enhanced it, but we haven't, um, and th there are changes to it. The two, um, the, the, the new student and teacher book are not compatible with the old student and teacher book. So um, that is something that you're going to have to make sure that if you if you're ordering new student books this year for you, for your kids or for your homeschools or in, or in your schools, you do need to get the new teacher's edition because the, the pages won't line up, the examples are different, and I'll go into some of what's changed. So the two books can't be used um, uh, interchangeably. You have to kind of pick one, either the old version or the new version and, and, and use it that way. Um, but there's lots of other, um, the, the, the bulk of what we, the spine of everything is very much the same. So um, uh, to, to try to build out what's new, there's really six kind of categories of things that are new. So I'm going to sort of name them, and then I'm going to break down each one of them and, and walk through that with you. So there's um, pedagogical resources that we've included in the new version, and I'll explain what those are. Additional resources just for teachers that we've built in, some of those pedagogical, but some of them not. Um, brand new examples. Uh, relevant to the 21st century, um, and I'll talk a little bit about that, um, expanded and clarified ex uh, explanations in the books, um, where um, there had been some places where just repeatedly people were like, I just don't understand this section, you know, whatever, or this this paragraph or whatever it was. Fifth, um, an, an acknowledgement of logic as a tool of wisdom seeking truth. And that's, and I, I do want to, I'm going to talk about that a, a good bit, because that's a significant um, enhancement. I think maybe perhaps the most important enhancement. The other ones are all very sort of practical. That one, I feel like it was that was really the driver for, for the fact that we needed to make this change. Um, and then the sixth is um, we address some formatting inconsistency, inconsistency. So there's more of a predictability to what you're going to find chapter per chapter, lesson per lesson, unit per unit, that kind of thing. So those are sort of the six different areas, and I'm going to talk about each one of those now. And I'm going to share my screen. I happen to have, um, this is the, the teacher's edition, um, and I'm going to be doing a screen share of the teacher's edition so that you can actually see, see what I'm seeing and, and not just have me talking about it or holding the book up awkwardly, that kind of thing. So um, you're going to sort of see me switch between looking just at you and um, then also screen sharing so that you can um, see that see the text itself. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and do that. So here we are um, with the uh, and I think can everybody I think you're seeing what I'm seeing. Um, let me just verify that I'm not showing you like my my email or something. Screen three. Yes, screen three. There we go. OK, so here we are. Um, the teacher's edition, the art, the art of argument, um, just just like what you were seeing. Um, we'll move here to the um, the table of contents page, uh, just so you can get a quick look at it. Uh, if you're just scanning very quickly, you're going to notice actually there's really not a whole lot different in as far as like what what even the headings are. There are a couple of new additions, but by and large, everything that's in that was in the old text is in here but we may have reworked it a little bit so the the pages are totally different um there's more pages in the new student edition so that won't line up if you're trying to get students to um you, you use the old book or you, and use the the new book in your class you really will need to make sure you get the correct edition of the book and just for clarity's sake the edition that you're looking for is edition 2.0 um and the you know the isbn number whoops that's not letting me do that uh the isbn number will be really helpful but um, and you can see that you know it should say uh, 2022 when you when you when you're when you're you know doing it uh, looking for it with your students and um, and your teachers. So anyway, um, something that you might notice right away is that there's a little bit of a splash of color. This is a four color book, um, and so we uh, the two primary colors are these here. But I think we think that adding the color in there, especially for the mock. Um, for the mock advertisements, because some of those were just kind of difficult to see, but now they kind of come to life now that they're in color. But again, just a, a quick overview of the table of contents and everything um, is you'll you'll see that um, not much um, 
uh, as far as the spine has really changed. Um, but one of the, um, as we look at, at pedagogical changes, I'm going to start with one of um, the most exciting features, and that is, and let me just turn it so the orientation is a way that you can see it well. Um, we are, we've now included a fallacy tree, and this fallacy tree is going to pop up throughout the entire book. Um, but please note that here on page 15 of the text, um, in the, in the teacher's edition, um, we have we have a fallacy tree, which really helps break down a whole bunch of, um, con, um, I think, visually break down and helps make clear some things that might not have been clear to students when they were just trying to hold all of the information in their head. Um, so, for example, we start with this idea that there is such a thing as argumentative persuasion, and there's also such a thing as non-argumentative persuasion. One is where you make an argument in an attempt to persuade, and one's where you don't make an argument in an attempt to persuade. And so we we, we really note here that we're just talking about argumentative persuasion, and there's two kinds of that. There's formal deductive reasoning, which this book is not about, and that's why it's kind of grayed out. And then there's informal arguments or the inductive reasoning, and that is what this book is about. And within informal arguments, we have strong arguments, and there are weak arguments, and those are informal fallacies. And you can see that that's really what we're talking about here. A lot of kids at least when I was teaching, would think to themselves that informal fallacies meant that they weren't arguments. Nope, they are arguments. They're just bad ones, right? They're just arguments that go awry somehow. This visual helps kids to really understand that we are still talking about arguments. And we give an analogy in the book, which is another one of the pedagogical tools that, um, that we've built in there is a lot more explanation by analogy that, for example, um, we probably all had this happen. Um, you try to bake a cake and it doesn't turn out well and it doesn't taste right. It is still a cake. It's just not a good one, right? Or you try to make something else, a steak dinner, mashed potatoes, you know, whatever it is. We make, we try to make something and you would still be able to recognize it as that is an attempt at a cake, that's attempt at mashed potatoes, that's an attempt at spaghetti or whatever it is, um, but it's just not very good. There's something off with the flavor or the texture or whatever. That's what weak arguments are. They're still arguments, but they're weak arguments. And so we give that analogy and explanation in the text, but the, the, the fallacy tree itself kind of helps to illuminate that. Another um, sort of idea that students had was that fallacy always equaled false, as in the argument was wrong because there was a fallacy, like the truth of it was wrong if there was a fallacy that was used. And something else that we try to make sure that we explain to students is that there's a difference between truth and validity. And we talk about that a little bit later too, that you can actually end up at a true conclusion, even if you have messed up the argument on the way there. Um, and so again, some of these visuals help students to see that falsity and fallacy are not synonyms for each other, right? We're not talking about truth on this fallacy tree. And that can sometimes be helpful, especially for students who are still very much thinking in the abs, uh, who haven't quite learned how to think in the abstract. Remember, we are talking about kids who are at that developmental stage if they're in the seventh or eighth grade range. And developmentally, some of them are really ready to start sort of thinking figuratively. Um, and some of them are still really anchored in the concrete. And if, you, if you're a homeschooling parent, then you know that you might even have a tendency to scoot in a couple of sixth graders into that and you know maybe a fifth grader. Um, and their, their ability to really understand and reason in the abstract can be even less so. And so knowing that there are kids on a range of sort of uh, you know understanding what is figurative and what is concrete reasoning, we tried to add in a few more pedagogical um, enhancements to help the the teachers and the students navigate through um, some of um, some of these differences a little bit more. Um, I'm going to go ahead and show us another instance of the way that the fallacy tree is um, used and enhanced. I'm going to go to this page. So when we get, so now we, we, we wanted to kind of get rid of some of the noise that was around that last, the, the last version, you'll, you'll see the difference between these two again. If I 
turn my page around for you so you can see it. Here, you know, we start with argumentative persuasion. We've got formal and informal. We've got invalid and valid over here. We've got strong and weak. We've got these questions here, and that's all very helpful. Um, but these are the fallacies, right? These, these guys right here, these are the fallacies that they're going to be learning. And so later in the book, um, we, we just kind of take away all the rest of that noise and we sort of highlight for them, okay, this is really the fallacy, the, the, the three trees that you're really working on when we're learning what these different informal fallacies really are. And then you can see that, um, for example, if we move into the beginning of chapter one, we're going to break that down even further. And we're going to say, we're just going to highlight fallacies of relevance here because we're talking about the fallacies of relevance. And oh, by the way, in chapter one, where we're talking about the ad fontem arguments, we're going to make sure that you know, okay, this is where we are. This is where we are in the lesson and learning. Um, and then, you know, as we go through, um, you can see that at the end of chapter one, this is the teacher's edition, so everything you see here in red is where the answers are filled in, that they would actually have um, a blank fallacy tree, and part of what they would need to do is produce these answers here for you um, in the, with the part that's orange in the orange square. And so we're trying to get them to understand sort of where do all of these fit together, how can we categorize them, you know, that kind of thing. And I'm going to talk a little bit about definitions here in just a minute, because that's another um, fallacy aid that we give in here, and that is that we now give an entire section um, very early on, you can see it's page seven in the at the very beginning of the book about defining our terms and crafting good definitions. And we're actually gonna teach students how to build good definitions. I can't tell you how important this is. It is such a transferable skill for students to learn what is the difference between a definition and a description, right? How many times have you asked a student for a definition and their answer is, well, it's kind of like when, right, is, you know, what, what's the definition of, um, you know, an ad hominem abusive? Well, it's kind of like when, um, you know, the candidate called this other candidate a name. That's an example, right? That's, that's more of a, um, that's an example of what a fallacy is. That's not the definition of what an ad hominem abusive is. And so we need to make sure that students understand how to build good definitions. But building good, good definitions is not isolated uh, in, you know, we don't just need that for the study of logic, that logic, we need that for everything, everything that we're doing that has a basic foundational understanding of what something is, we need to understand what it is, what it's related to, what is its genus and species, those kinds of things. Um, and so we actually take the time to learn how to build that. So we recommend four steps in building a good definition. I'm going to make this just a little bit bigger in case your computer's um, screen is small. Um, we start with identifying the etymology of the word. Then we identify the category or the genus that the word uh, in which the word fits, it belongs. Um, and we tell, we say what genus is and we tell what that is. Um, then we identify what distinguishes the word that we're trying to define from other things in the same category. And then we use the etymology, the category, and the difference to craft a description of the word that would apply generally and everywhere and, you know, sort of a universally appropriate de definition of what the word is. Now we have when, you know, your kids are always wondering, like, what makes for a good definition? If it meets these four criteria, then you can say if the students have a good definition. And again, this is something that your students should be learning how to do, not just so that they are regurgitating information, they should really know, they should own the information. And part of that is learning this. So um, how to build a good definition. So we even give an example here, how would we define the word human? And so we go up, we go through, you know, everything from let's define it, let's step one, two, and three, and then the final step here. So we classify it, um, or, you know, uh, and we go through what it is, what is the etymology, how can we identify the category, how can we identify what makes it different inside that category, and finally, the, you know, universally appropriate definition of the word human would be from the Latin homo or um, um, hom homonymous, uh, sorry, my Latin wasn't so great. Uh, um, a human is a mammal that is intelligent enough to use complex language, calculate with numbers, and create art. 
Um, and then we use the same method to classify fallacies. And so we show them how we're going to use these basic principles um, with the ad hominem uh, uh, fallacy here, with the ad hominem abusive fallacy, and we go through so that the students don't have to just memorize the fallacies any longer. They can really understand why they belong into different categories and go through a series of questions where they're using the definitions, the, the, uh, the building blocks of the definitions to help them reason out where these fallacies belong. And that's, that's another pedagogical tool. Students will not remember the information just because they've memorized it. Memories fade. But if we teach them how to build a good definition, they will be able to deductively assign and figure out what, you know, what these fallacies are because they better understand what a definition is actually for. So we've got um, the new fallacy tree, which is a pedagogical resource for students and teachers. We've got how to build a definition. We even have um, some Socratic questioning, and I'm going to show you another example of some Socratic questioning here. Socratic questioning, as you know, is a, it's a very important um, part of the pedagogical training. And here again, we go back to the fallacy tree, uh, and I just want to um, highlight it here. We're going to start using these questions, um, and you'll recognize these. They were in the previous edition. We just didn't call them out, and we didn't command uh, command anything from them. And um, students really need to begin to form, and we repeat this phrase over and over again in the text, begin an internal dialogue. Logic is not about just observing and just like having the answer sort of smack us in the face. Logic is about developing an internal dialogue. And these three questions are the building blocks to developing that internal dialogue. And what we see then is that we need to, and this is um, on page 37 of the, the teacher's edition, that we need to find the main issue by asking the right questions. And now we start um, we start to walking them through how can they really find the main issue of of any of any um, of any argument that they're that they're in debate with. This is the, this is so crucial. Um, if students if they can't tell what the main what the main issue is, um, and if, if or if um, the speaker isn't clear about what the main issue is they're going to end up creating fallacies and missing fallacies. So this is, this is an essential part that just really wasn't fleshed out in, in much the same way um, as, we, as we do now uh, flesh it out. So as we go back and we look here, it says your job as a logician is to learn how to diagnose where your arguments or the arguments of others break down so that you can repair them and continue pursuing the truth. Um, and we'll talk about that pursuit of truth. I told you that was one of the, the big, the big, big pieces here. But we learning how to do this is something that now we've given um, a, like an explanation for what their responsibility is as they're going through this text. It's so important for students to recognize that th this book is not a vocabulary book. They're not supposed to learn a vocabulary list of 28 terms, learn how to spell them, and then learn how to define them. What they're really supposed to be doing is learning how to live with them. And to do that, they need to be able to adopt some, some skills. And those skills include, include um, identifying what is the issue at hand? What is that main issue that they are trying to speak into in whatever um, topic or discussion that they're having? So this Socratic questioning comes back over and over and over again, and we'll see it um, in a variety of lessons where um, we give um, the explanation for maybe um, what the student, what, what additional questions a student might want to ask, and then we give an example of a fallacy, and we say, is this, is this person committing a fallacy? And we say, let's use those questions. And the student is supposed to go through those questions before they get to our explanation. Right, and actually it's built into the text now to sort of prompt them with what some of those questions are. And I think that that's a really helpful way to teach kids to Socratically go through logic. Remember, and I say this every time I give a logic webinar, logic has never been intended to live within the confines of the textbook. It's always intended to be brought out and applied to the world around you. And to do that, you have to learn how to use it in a Socratic way. Um, the other, the other, one of the other pedagogical tools, and this certainly isn't an exhaustive list, 
is that we're trying to teach by uh, by analogy. And as I, as I said, analogies are just so, so helpful. G.K. Chesterton, St. Augustine, Dante, I mean, so many of the great master teachers all taught by analogy. And one of the things that we have to do is recognize that that's a very important way for students to learn. So one of the things that we talk about with logic, and I'm going to give you an example of how we do this by analogy, is sort of talking about that we say that logic is the art and science of reasoning, right? And that, that's the sort of the standard boilerplate definition that the students need to memorize, and we, we know it, that, that probably that definition by heart. But one of the things that I thought might help and I, I really, this was one of the things that I used in my class, one of the explanations I used in my classes, and you could just see the light bulb go off. So I'm going to read it to you. So it talks about the fact that <clears throat> logic, so this whole big chunk up here is about how logic is an art. <clears throat> and we get here and it says logic is an art, but it also has some characteristics of a science. While art helps us become a maker, a science helps us discern the governing principles by which we can organize a body of knowledge. Think of an oil painting, for example. So if we can just go back, this first sentence is kind of like, or these first two sentences, a kid is going to read this and they're going to be kind of like, okay, I don't know if I understand that yet, but hopefully this explanation will help. So think of an oil painting. Nothing is more quintessentially art than a beautiful Renoir painting. But if you think about it, there's a quite a lot of science that went into the creation of each one of his famous paintings. Renoir employed chemistry to create and blend his paints. He had to understand light and shadow, scale, foreshadowing, all elements of science. The construction of the elements he used, vibrant colors, lifelike textures, light, beauty, shapes, and images. And while it's often easiest to see those artistic qualities in his painting, we must acknowledge that they are also evidence of an applied science. It would be <clears throat> impossible to entirely separate the science of his painting from the art of his painting. His paintings are world famous because they are a delicate, indistinguishable, intricate dance between the two. And here's, so like painting, so now we're using that analogy, logic too has some laws or principles that govern it, right? For example, one of the fundamental laws of logic is called the law of non-contradiction, and it goes on to describe what that is. Um, and so we can see that the art of what logic is, is kind of propped up and governed by some of those principles um, of what logic is. And now we can see that logic is really, just like so many things, kind of a blend of art and science. That's an actual lesson that the students need to learn. And you know, there's obviously lots that you have to go through in a conversation, but we're starting to add in more of these analogies to help take some of these more abstract and complex concepts and bring them to a place where a student can say, oh, I see, of course, art that I'm looking at has both that, you know, the beauty and the, the, you know, the light and the shadow, you know, all of those kinds of things. And it's all fused together because it's art and science together. Um, and, and logic is like that. And now we just have to discover how, how is logic like that? And hopefully the text does a good job of that too. So adding in some of these pedagogical resources and some of the other things that I'll get to in here in just a minute are also evidences of pedagogy, but that was one of the driving motivators uh, for the book is making sure that we built in more more of those kinds of classical pedagogical pieces that will help any teacher and student navigate through the text. The next thing that I wanted to um, focus on, and again, I'm not, I'm not being exhaustive here by any means, is that we have added in a bunch of resources for the teacher and we start with this uh, more elaborate note to teachers. And so there's a little bit of a welcome and we tell you kind of what some of the new things are. Number one, we teach students how to define their terms and we've told you why and some of what I have shared with you. Um, and we've given you an idea about where the definitions and the fallacies are and how to use them. And there's, a ver you know, there's variations in definitions and all kinds of things. So we're trying to give, help you understand why we built this text this way when it comes to, um, when, it, when it comes to definitions. So there, there, that's a resource for you. We've talked about the fallacy tree, fallacy examples from the web. We've actually now given you some examples. One of the, the questions that I have received most over the years, and by the way, if you ever write into it, like ask the Magister questions, that email comes to me. Um, so <laughs> I'm usually the one that's trying to think about the question that, you, that you've had, and then I'm usually the one answering it. And this is the question that we've gotten the most. One thing that people, what the teachers are always looking for is, can you share some of you, the examples that you have found? 
Now, I want to say, first and foremost, there is absolutely, you're, gonna, you're never going to learn how to take and lift logic outside the confines of the textbook as well as if you actually do that. If you only, if you use this more as a script and like, well, you know, Joelle Hodge says I should use this, you know, example, this web example, you know, with this fallacy, that's fine to learn, but you should be looking. And these are just ones that Dr. Larson and I um, have found over our years of teaching um, and, and looking at them. And we found some, some, I think, some very good examples of it. But there again, uh, that's something that you'll you'll want to make sure that you are looking for yourself. But we help get you started. Um, there are some you've got to keep some things in mind. Um, and I, I'm going to say this here just because it's so important. Um, at, for all external examples that we offer in this text, you're going to want to first watch or listen to the content on your own before sharing with your students. I cannot stress that enough. You know better than we do what your students are prepared to discuss. The examples that we include in this book are intended to provoke discussion and debate and help illuminate the fallacies. The examples were not intended to convey our preferences for one side of an issue over another side. And you're going to find arguments, fallacies, from liberals, conservatives, various religious points of view, and they're all fallacious, right? This book is designed to teach students how to spot bad arguments wherever they're found. Um, so you're gonna wanna watch them carefully. You might not want to introduce a particular voice into your classroom and that's fine. So, but make sure that you aren't just thinking, oh, it's in here, I'll just assign this for homework. I have to stress and caution, please don't do that. And then, um, you know, because I said, depending on the makeup of my classes over the years, I've omitted some examples and I've used others and you're going to want to do the same. And here's one more caution. Please know that at the time that Classical Academic Press printed those books, the content featured on those sites was suitable for, you know, a, a range of ages. But however, people can change their websites and they don't have to check with us just because we we included the website in our textbook and they're not calling, oh gosh, we better not put that advertisement up on this page now because we know that Classical Academic Press is using this, this website. So please, 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 I can't stress enough. Watch the videos, go to the websites, make sure that, and if, and if you spot that there is now an ad or some response or something on a web page that you think they probably wouldn't have recommended this web page if they knew that this was on it, send it in because chances are they change their website. So again, back to teacher resources, uh, fallacy examples in the text, we're trying to train students to be active readers. So we're going to actually be um, another resource for you is we're going to be prompting you where, where you might want to be telling students, underline this, highlight this, bold this. You're going to want to be, um, you know, annotating your books in some ways. Um, so anyway, that, that's another prompt and resource that we're giving you. We are uh, creating fallacy examples and what to expect from your students. This is an idea that I had that really worked quite well. Um, it's kind of a pedagogical technique, but it's also an idea that you might want to include. The student fallacy notebook. And the gist of that is this. Um, as we would go through fallacies, I would talk to students about taking logic outside the confines of the textbook and go use it and try to find it in the world around them. And I would let them put it in a fallacy notebook and they could bring that fallacy notebook to me anytime they wanted to. And they would tell me, I found, I think I found this fallacy in literature, in a speech and, you know, an essay, whatever it is. Um, and here's the fallacy that I think it is. And I would set, tell them only if they were right or wrong. And if they were right, then they knew that that was a correct fallacy and they could use that later. And I'll tell you how, but if it was wrong, then they had to kind of go, I mean, it, it was probably, me probably was a fallacy of something, but they might not have labeled it correctly. And so they, I wouldn't give them any hints. I wouldn't do it for them. I would just say, nope, that you've, it is a fallacy, but nope, that's not the right answer. And they'd have to work at it to come up with the right answer. Come test time, I told them that they were allowed to use those fallacy notebooks, because if you're like me, you wanted them to maybe create some of their own fallacies. It is incredibly hard for students in a 45 minute time period to create fallacies just out of the blue under the pressure of a test. They had already done all that work in their fallacy notebook. And so I, it was theirs. They found it, they, they identified it, they recognized it as a fallacy, they labeled it correctly, at least over time. And they were allowed to copy that one from their fallacy notebook onto the test. And we would mark that one as already used in their fallacy notebook so they couldn't use it again on a future test. 
but they really, it, it, it did two things. One, it took all the pressure off and still accomplished the same goal come test time, but it really got them looking on the, on the fly everywhere all the time for, um, for what the fallacies were in real life. And that was, that's really what we're wanting from them anyway. So hopefully, um, hopefully you might find that to be a helpful tool, but that was an, another teacher resource that we, um, that, that we found to be very, very helpful. Um, and at least in my classes. Um, another teacher resource that we provide for you is you're going to see a lot of, and let me see here if I can find one kind of quickly. Um, obviously everything in here in red, um, including these little, whoops, if you see this little A here, and then a little bit further down in the same chapter, you might see, oh, of course I can't find one, 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 two, uh, keep going, keep going, keep going. These are all, oh, here's a, I must have missed B, here's a C. Um, we, if you, at the end of every chapter, we have collected, um, a, all of our footnotes. So this is where, as you're reading along, capital T truth versus lowercase t truth. This is a question we got all the time. And now you don't have to necessarily be an expert in philosophy about Plato and, and so forth. We try to help make sure that we're giving you some of that information. So um, you'll notice that all of these letters then correspond to places in the text. So this is the teacher footnotes. And we've really tried to give you some, some you know, really excellent footnotes here for you. Some things that can either prompt discussion, um, expand your knowledge and understanding, give you additional resources, just another explanation, common student mistakes that happen at this point in the book with this explanation. And so that you can say, now a lot of students, you know, um, you know, you know, confuse irrelevant thesis and irrelevant goals and functions. Um, and here's, and let me, let me explain how, you know, what the difference between these two are. We've kind of highlighted those based off of the acquired knowledge that we've had in teaching this course every year. There's nothing worse than feeling like as a teacher that you, you are um, kind of restricted to the same body of knowledge that your students are. Because then if you, if the answer isn't in this book, and there, and you only have access to the exact same content, and they ask a question, you're going to think, oh boy, I don't know how to answer this question, and we have all been there. So we tried to make sure that the student text is robust, and they have everything that they're going to need, but just having taught these sections before, and knowing these are the kinds of questions that kids ask when they get to this spot, or you're going to want to help them um, avoid a barrier that kids naturally fall into if you don't give this explanation. Um, we try to make sure that you have some of that in the teacher resources as well. Um, and so I'll give you one more explanation. So it's not just at the beginning, um, not explanation example. Um, that one's kind of at the beginning of the book. And then um, here's another one. Um, uh, oh, this is one, is this the one I was thinking of? Maybe not. Anyway, this is um, for just a different chapter in the book. Um, and and you can you can easily see that we give lots and lots of you know explanations for teachers as a sidebar. Um, one of the other uh, I said we gave new examples that were modern for the 21st century. That one's probably um, self-explanatory. But there in the old book there were examples that included you know sports figures like Michael Jordan and Dan Marino and um, or you know referred to. Um, uh, either conversations with, you know, involving presidents or, you know, just all sorts of things that you had to almost be like, okay, well, back in 1992, when Bill Clinton was, you know, elected president, blah, 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 blah. Um, and the kids, they're like, that is, you know, 30 years ago. I don't, well, you know, my parents were barely alive at that point. I don't know what's going on. So anyway, so um, that would be really helpful. It's more helpful so that you don't have to sort of set a table every single time for every single example. So we've modernized the um, we've modernized the examples just in a way to just take down some of those additional barriers. People have been creating fallacies in the last thirty years, so it wasn't challenging to do at all. Uh, let's see here. Enhanced explanations. Um, so I've alluded to this before. It's a little bit of a pedagogical um, in, uh, increase as well, but um, five. So um, uh, this idea of increasing uh, and identifying where teachers and students typically have questions and kind of fleshing out those areas. So what does it need, mean to presume? Um, we've 
the uh, we we get it. We had a lot of questions about the difference between presumption and presupposition, and so we've we've tried to flesh out some of those areas as well. Um, uh, let's see here. Um, where was I? Oh, here's one. Um, we all make assumptions. So students and, and you know middle schoolers are they're 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 very smart, and they'll say. Uh, you know, we're talking about bad, uh, faulty assumptions, bad, bad presuppositions that we're that we're thinking about. And students are very quick to say, you know, I assume a lot of things. I assume that the sun's going to come up in the morning. I assume that because my parents told me that my curfew was, you know, 1030 last night, it's probably 1030 tonight. I assume all, you know, I assume that at the, you know, whatever, that, that you know, if my teacher said that the homework was due the next day, it's probably due the next day that we work on a lot of assumptions and students are right to sort of say which ones of these are you know are are fallacies and which ones aren't and so we've tried to give some explanations for where you know some of those kinds of things where you have to there's a nuance to it so like all fallacies it's easy to fall into fallacies of presupposition this is because we are all fallible and we have to make assumptions on a variety uh, on various kinds of practical uh, practically to live our lives and so we are used to making them right so we have to this is where we have to say them this isn't a black or white issue and this is getting away from things being concrete like it's always this way and never this way yes it's absolutely appropriate to make assumptions sometimes but there are other times where it's not appropriate to make assumptions and we have to learn that subtle nuance and there's a wisdom to that, right? A prudence to figuring that out. And that's what we try to, add, we've added in some of those explanations to help students who are really like at the cusp of being able to think a little bit more dynamically and a little bit less um, concretely about what some of these more gray areas are that we have to um, what that we might have to look into a little bit more closely. And then another one that we've talked about um, as well is, hmm, and I'm sorry, let's see here. That was the wrong, let me see it. Maybe I was looking at the page instead of the, uh, the number up there. We'll, we'll skip this one for now because I don't want us to run too short on time. Um, there were a couple of other fallacies where, or a couple of others where we tried to identify where there was going to be um, some frustration or not frustration, but confusion. Um, let me back up real quickly to here because here you can see um, what these ads look like in color versus the black and white ones, which just didn't show them off quite as well. So this is, you know, a place where the color really um, is very helpful. But I'm going to try to find this one uh, example. Sorry, you might be getting dizzy. Think about something else for a second. What number is this? It's one six. I'm looking for one sixty four. I'm almost there. One eighty three. Just a little bit further. Maybe it's here. Okay, 167, more fallacy examples. Okay, and nope, that wasn't it. So that was a wasted trip. Sorry about that. Okay, we're gonna move to the idea of inquiry seeking truth um, and just how important it is. And this was one of the, the, the pieces that I told you was just so important um, for why we wanted to um, ensure that we were building this in. We, there is a, um, there's a sense in which when anytime we make an argument that we want to be right and that there is there's um that there's a there's pressure on on kids as well and adults to if you're going to make an argument you don't want to be wrong about it um and that prompts in some cases pride arrogance foolishness those kinds of things and something that was really missing, that acknowledgement that we all have this human tendency and propensity to be want, desirers of being correct and getting like, that's the right answer. I'm so proud of you. Instead of contributing to the pursuit of truth. And if truth is what we're really seeking, then it doesn't really matter who finds it because we all get there. Um, and so this is this is one of those cases where we we started really wanting to highlight this as something that is a distinctive. So the first thing we talked about, the, one of the first things we want to talk about is hosting a class discussion about the modern notion of, you know, my truth, which is an idea that acknowledges and legitimizes each of our biases and experiences, but simultaneously erodes 
the notion of a universal truth. So you're going to want to have that conversation and identify that and, and make sure that your conversation in class really kind of lays this out on the table. And we give you some ideas about, you know, what you, how you can be, you know, um, you know, what you could be maybe reading, how you can approach this, that kind of thing. So that's one of the things that we have to be thinking about here. But another one of them is back to what I was kind of describing before. And we really talk about this being that the students, if they're really trying to be a philosopher, then they are, they should be a lover of wisdom and a seeker of truth. And there's two helpful principles that we need, that they should really guide them whenever they're trying to articulate their opponent's position or their own, that your integrity is more important than being right. And it's more important that you are gracious, respectful, and honest than it is that you are perceived as the winner of an argument. Is it really winning, and this is with regard to a straw man fallacy, if you've created a straw man out of your opponent's position and then beaten it with your robust argument? Not really. We've said it before, we want you to fight fair when we engage in a rational discussion or debate. And if you win because you've essentially dumbed down your opponent's position to absurdity, you haven't really actually won the argument. Right. So this is really kind of we this is a human tendency that we have. And here's the, the next one. If you believe if what you believe is, in fact, the truth, you can rest assured that the truth doesn't need your help to be true. If a claim is really true and it, it can and should withstand the harshest critics and the strongest arguments. So there's no need to construct a, far, a straw man argument of your opponent's position. Do your homework prepare for your argument, and then engage in the debate with all of your strength. And we just, these are this kind of building integrity into what the students, um, how the students are pursuing this from a point of humility um, and a graciousness and a charity for others um, is so important. Um, and it, it really, I think it's so needed in our culture today with the way that we kind of, um, kind of take no prisoners um, and I, uh, you know, and, and are willing to sort of beat each other up for the sake of the truth, you know, kind of thing. Um, and I, I use this example when I've given talks uh, about rhetoric. Um, when we're making an argument and we're really trying to be persuasive, the word persuasive means that you have, you have so, um, the, the words that you have spoken have generated a turning in someone's heart and mind and that now they agree with you. Persuasion is not about bludgeoning someone and yelling at them and telling them how stupid they are. Persuasion is you really genuinely wanting to help them see the truth of something and maybe see where they were in error. And maybe you're gonna learn something along the way as well, because we all have something to learn in, in any situation. But what this really requires then is that we care, that we truly care for one another, that we are, if we're in an argument, if we're in a debate, it's because there is a relationship here and we care about the other individual so much that we don't want them mired in darkness and, and, and laboring through illogical reasoning and, and misinformation. We genuinely care about them and want them to find their way to the truth. And if that's the if that's the reason for argument and debate, and it isn't you're wrong, and I want to make sure you know you're wrong, um, so I can be right, then we really approach that very differently, right? Think about how you when you really truly care for someone that 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 the way that we persuade then becomes an act of love to them, and not you know, not a sword that we're kind of trying to make sure that they, you know, their, their opinions die with, you know, with, with their argument kind of thing. And that's really the spirit that we're trying to get at here is that we need to get away from this idea of kind of in social media, just sort of throwing out um, arguments out into the abyss of the digital world where, you know, we don't really care who it's landing on. We should, we should be in in relationship with people and thinking about our arguments as if we're in relationship with people because we genuinely care about them. And so there is this idea of inquiry seeking truth, which is a very humble uh, position, and also this idea of um, really um, how, what kind of integrity do we want to have as someone who's arguing? And so that's, we don't try to, you know, we're not trying to turn this into, you know, sort of a Sunday school lesson kind of thing, but it's woven in in such a way. I hope that there are gentle reminders throughout the text of being lovers of wisdom and seekers of the truth. So 
Um, the last um, enhancement, and that, believe it or not, we've gone through five, so there's one more here, um, is formatting consistencies. Um, and there are, um, this this is one of the ones that just, you know, I'm a little bit type A, you know, you kind of have to be if you're going to write a logic or contribute to writing a logic textbook. And the, the formatting inconsistencies in the last book, they just always graded on me a little bit. You know, why wasn't there a fallacy dialogue for, you know, um, you know, this particular introduction, but there were for all these other ones. It didn't make any sense. And anyway, so going through this time, um, we we have righted much of that. So we introduced the fallacies consistent consistently. Um, and we have included now some additional Socratic dialogues that where we were maybe missing some of them. So one of the ones that we've included here is um, here is dialogue on hiding in plain sight, developing your x-ray vision. And again, this is sort of an argument. This is like introducing the fallacies by way of analogy. But we often talk about the fact that assumptions are hidden. They're hidden assumptions. You don't see them right away. Well, if they're hidden, how are you supposed to find them, right? I mean, that's just, that's like somebody telling you, it's not important whether you get the right answer. It's about asking the right questions. And you're like, yeah, but what are the right questions? I don't know what the right questions are. Um, we have to teach kids how to find these hidden assumptions, right? And there, there are ways to go about detecting it. You know, you can't see wind, for example, but you can see evidences of the wind, right? You can see things blowing, you can see, tree, you know, leaves, you can hear it sometimes in the rustling of things. So we have to teach them to look for evidences of hidden assumptions, because they all leave a little bit of a fingerprint, if you will. Um, I'm just mixing metaphors all over the place here, but they all leave a little bit of a fingerprint. Um, but you, you have to learn how to spot those. So we we introduce this idea of, because this is a skill that they have to learn of, of finding hidden assumptions. And so we have a Socratic dialogue where Socrates and Nate, I think it's Nate, are talking about um, x-ray vision. And of course, Socrates has no idea what x-ray vision is. And so that's a little bit of a thing. So um, so that's that's one example of, of a way that we have enhanced not only the formatting to add some consistency, but that we've um, developed some uh, some additional. Uh, here's another one we, we've, we've built in. So a dialogue on clarity. We were missing a dialogue on clarity. Um, and so this is another one where we, we introduce clarity through one of our Socratic discussions. And it's just so that in every single chapter, there is now a more consistent introduction to the way, not chapter, yeah, in, into every single chapter we've, we've, we're introducing with a dialogue that has some, uh, some ability to sort of extend, add a good analogy, that kind of thing. And then um, we've also tried to, um, another thing that we've done, oh, so um, we, another thing that we've tried to build in here is the way that we've built out our examples. So we give several, a couple of examples usually, and then we have some explanations um, where we have, you know, the students walking through them rather than just giving them uh, example, explanation, example, explanation. Now there's sort of a chunk of examples and you as the teacher can say, we're not going to look at the explanations just yet. Everybody just stay here and look. And we, you can use them now for in-class Socratic discussions and dialogues and sort of wrestling through it, knowing that the explanations are going to be coming in a little bit, um, but we don't spoil it too soon by just taking away all of their ability to sort of suss things out on their own and use the tools that we're trying to give them. So we've we've standardized that a little bit and added some consistency there, which should be another pedagogical tool for you and a resource for teachers. So um, one final a quick thing that I just wanted to show you that's um, as far as extensions go um, is this new uh, website that we also created to go along with it. And so you or your students might find this to be fun um, and enjoyable. We have a new Art of Argument website. There's a quiz that you can take. Um, I've already taken um, the first quiz. So, um, uh, but anyway, you can take it and you can go through and, and see how well you do on the Art of Argument quiz. Um, we have the fallacies here and you can learn more. Your students can kind of go through and learn. Here's a description. And then there's an example of it as well for every single one of the fallacies here. Um, each of them has, and they're all broken up the exact same way. And this is artofargument.com. Um, and then there are some other some other pieces that we have. We built some actual physical flashcards for you and your for your class or for your students to have at home. Um, and then we also have, and I don't have a picture to show you right now, but the picture, the actual 
there's a poster of the fallacy tree so that you can have it up in your classroom and that those kinds of things. Um, there's a couple of other features here that um, aren't, aren't built out yet, but if you keep coming back, you're going to see there's a little bit more here for the um, on, on the website. Eventually, there's going to be a place for um, uh, the, there's like an image randomizer. You'll be able to come and see an image pop up. The student can try to make a fallacy. Um, uh, you know, just using the image um, and a, 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 as an inspiration for their fallacy. Sometimes you just need sort of a prompt um, and, and that can kind of help you think about how you might want to create a fallacy. And that sometimes that can be helpful as a fun game in class or to practice that kind of thing. So anyway, a couple of more resources for students and teachers and families um, and things that we thought might be fun and useful. So with that, um, and I just saw, do you know when those pre-orders are going to ship soon, I think? Um, I, but we can definitely check on on that for you. So that those will be coming. I know some of you ordered the did the pre order a little while ago, but I do promise you they're coming and they'll be out this summer for sure. So well before the start of school. But um, all right, with that, um, my presentation is pretty well finished, and I'm happy to take some questions um, if we have some. I'm sure we do. I'm actually going to turn my fan on because my office. Here, classical academic press doesn't seem to have much air conditioning. So just give me one second while Megan, you sort through the questions. Sounds great. Awesome. Thank you very much for your talk. I'll get a few questions out up here for you. And if we don't get to your question, I will go ahead. And um, if you wouldn't mind putting your email in there, if we don't get to it, I will go ahead and make sure we can get that answered for you, even if it's not live up here. But I will go ahead and pick some out for you here. And we can go through a few of these, and then um, shortly before at least 1.30, we'll be sure to wrap up here. So there you go. Got the first one here from Chris Johnston there for you. So the question reads, I see a huge range of ability levels in my classes. Some of the kids are college level at logic just naturally, and some just cannot get their heads around the topic. How do you or others watching handle the kids who just do not click with logic even after all the extra meetings, et cetera? That is such a good question. Um, and I guess it's, it, you know, one of the questions I would have, and I, you know, I, you're asking sort of a, a question without, and, and there's no specifics and you know that and I know that, but, um, you know, are we talking about students with learning differences or are we talking about students who maybe just aren't quite there yet developmentally? Um, and those are two different things. If we're talking about students with learning differences that um, then, then, you know, just having extra meetings, you know, it might be something where we actually need different kinds of accommodations and there may be a little bit more of a limit as to what these students are going to be able to walk away with. Um, and again, that's going to, there's a whole range of um, various learning differences that would either, you know, have very little difference or, you know, significant differences and only you would know that. If we're talking about students who are sort of developmentally not ready that yet, then, um, and this is something that um, I've noted for the discovery of deduction, and it probably is an important thing to think about as well here. For discovery of deduction, there is no math in the discovery of deduction. There's no, there's no math in it. I know that sometimes people try to think, often think that there's logic and math kind of aren't go hand in hand, but it's really, it's really as a trivium art, not as a quadrivium art that we, that we introduce math. Uh, I'm sorry, that we introduce discovery of deduction and logic. But that being said, I very often tell people that if their students have not been able to successfully complete a course in pre-algebra before they take the discovery of deduction, they might not be developmentally ready to think and reason in the abstract. And so I, I, I use that math marker because if a student can't sort of, um, if they can't think about what X might be in the abstract and that we're not just solving for a concrete number and not that numbers are concrete but they don't know that um but if they if they can't really reason in the abstract in some way then um then it would be they they might be ill suited to to do the discovery of deduction which involves syllogisms and uh, propositional logic to some degree and that kind of thing it might be something too where you say okay maybe a student needs to successfully complete a course in pre-algebra um, before they can take the art of argument, um, depending on if some of these extra aids and support and those kinds of things don't help. Developmentally, it can be, they, sometimes students just aren't quite ready to think about that fallacy and falsity aren't the same thing. That's just like mind blown for some of them. So you just, you do want to just wait and 
um, just like we allow students to take math classes kind of at the appropriate time and at the appropriate level, it might be that we say, and we, you know, you get to take logic at the appropriate time and at the appropriate yeah. level. But that's one way to maybe think it through. But certainly it's a challenging question and, um, and one that, that I know a lot of people are wrestling with. Thank you. Awesome. And the next question asks, um, is it wise to allow students to practice arguing on the opposite side of what they believe? You know, that's a really good question because there's a danger to that too. And I know what that danger is, right? That the students then, they learn all the really compelling reasons why they're wrong in the first place. And now they adopt this other idea. Um, but at the same time, right, the other side of that argument is, well, um, if they're, if we're really talking about what is true, um, that, you know, it would be a really, it would be very important for them to know what all of the arguments on the opposing side are, and then be able to see how they are actually refuted in some way, in a very con a constructive way. I don't personally find it helpful for students to practice arguing things that are not true and using bad reasoning to get there. I do find it helpful for students to go through and identify an opponent's argument and identify what they believe and why they believe it and not use straw man fallacies to do that, to really look at what are their strongest, best arguments for what, for what it is that they're reasoning there. Where do we agree? And then there, because usually, as you know, um, when folks get things wrong on the truth, it's really rarely, are they just all the way over here and we're all the way over there. Usually there's some point where we do agree on things and then there's a perversion of the truth or we go in, we go in a different way and some from at some at some point we diverge. Um, so I think it's very helpful for students to see and you know here's where we agree up to this point. Here's where their argument diverges. Let's look at that together and identify what they believe and why they believe it in their strongest terms. And then let's analyze what maybe what's wrong with those, I, what their reasoning is or what's wrong with the, un, like the underlying facts that they are coming with. Because it's either, um, and if you've studied deductive logic, you know that there's truth plus validity equals a sound argument. And that's what we're all really aiming for. So either they've gotten, if you arrive at the wrong answer, it's either because you started with false propositions, or your reasoning was incorrect, or a combination of the two. And it's important for students to see their reasoning, you know, it, given the facts that they were working with, their reasoning is actually not that bad, but their facts were incorrect. Let's start with the correct presuppositions. Or they started with the presuppositions, and we all agree with these, and somehow they got over here. Their reasoning went awry. Let's look at where their reasoning went awry. And that really helps students, I, I think, more so than having students actually argue other positions that are like morally or ethically, you know, wrong in some way, where they have to embody, own, master the arguments of the other side and never really come to terms with faulty presuppositions or faulty reasoning. So that's my opinion. Um, and I'm sure that that would be debated. And there's, again, I don't think that, you know, you're a terrible teacher if you have your teacher, students doing that, but that I would do it maybe a little bit differently, so. Perfect, we have a couple questions here from Jennifer H. Um, they're kind of connected, so I figured I'd just put them in one place for you. So Jennifer is telling us that she is a parent and there's a tutors or teeters, teacher slash tutor, apologies, um, for the course uh, who will have the teacher guide, but as a parent, she does not have that guide. So she is asking, are there online resources parents would need to help their child and support their tutor, um, especially if the tutor is going quickly and they're missing some tips? Or um, like you were mentioning for the fallacy book, is there a way to keep track which ones have been used and haven't from the parent side? Um, so I just suppose any tips on those two questions or further than that, what a parent can do to support a child in the class? Well, that's that, you know, I, that, you know, the, the only danger, I'm using air quotes here, danger with having parents have the teacher's edition is that now the kids might have access to the answer key and that they might have access to the tests or, to, you know, tests and quizzes, that kind of thing. And that is something that we want to make sure that students don't have access to because 
human nature says that if it's there, there's at least a temptation to go look every once in a while. So I would say, you know, if, do, if your teacher is doing a good job at school and there's good communication, um, you should be fine with um, allowing the student to have his or her um, student textbook um, and, and kind of going along as well. If the teacher's a good communicator and telling you, telling the parents, we had a really interesting conversation today about what my truth is versus what the truth is against, you know, what is capital T truth versus lowercase t truth. You know, if there's some kind, if your, if your teacher or tutor can be very communicative about some of these extra kinds of things, that can be very helpful um, for a parent just to sort of know more about what's going on in the classroom. Students can come home with some of that information, um, and that's often that's often really helpful to do. Sometimes students don't, you know, they don't always grasp everything the first time they hear it, and and just like anybody else, um, you know, we, you kind of lose a generation of quality with some of that. So if you think that you've got a student who's going to struggle and they're not going to be able to relay information to you as easily, you know, I would start with talking with the teacher or tutor find out if they can be more communicative about what's going on in the classroom. But I mean, it's it's a free country and you you know you know what the Classical Academic Press website is. If you feel like you need it, hide the book when you get it and just make sure that you're keeping up with it. I mean, I don't know that anybody has to know that so long as you're not taking away your students' opportunity to make mistakes, to learn on their own and to reason through why they might be wrong. That's the learning process there. It's really not about the right answer. So if you're not robbing them of that by you having a teacher's edition, it's probably not the, I mean, I, I don't know that it would be wrong to have a teacher's edition in the house. I don't know if that answered the question. So. And just putting this one quickly after that, just because it's related, um, is the teacher manual parent friendly for any parents who haven't learned logic before? Can a parent still teach it well? Yes, absolutely. And I've actually given a talk in previous years to parents. I used to go to the GHC conferences and I would give a talk almost every year because it was high in demand. You know more logic than you think you do. You don't know the names of the fallacies to label them, but you cannot be living in the 21st century and not recognize when an argument does not sound right, did not sit right. There's you, you know more logic than you think you do. You just don't have the vocabulary. You can pick up this book, you can teach from it. And when you get to these fallacies, you're gonna be like, oh, that's what that's called. Now I have a word for it. And there you go. Um, something else to keep in mind that we are actually creating another book for adults. And it's called, um, it's going to be called That's a Fallacy. And I think it's going to be, fingers crossed, don't quote me on this, maybe coming out at the end of the year. Um, and it's going to be kind of a trimmed down version. It's not going to have all the student examples and, you know, all that kind of stuff, but it's going to be for an adult to be able to, to, to read. So now if you're teaching, you would want the teacher's edition, you know, because you need to go through and to correct answers and, you know, all that kind of thing. But if you're just a parent who's thinking, I would love to know this because your students will get the upper hand. They will get the better of you if you don't know your fallacies, and they do. So um, at a certain point, you do need to learn your fallacies, even if you're not teaching it. And that that's a fallacy book that's coming out later um, will be, you know, it's going to be quick and easy. But the point is, you already know when bad arguments are being made. You just need the vocabulary of what to call them. Perfect. And um, a few people have asked, so just pinning one of these here, uh, are there plans to update the videos in the upcoming years? Are the former videos still compatible, even if the texts are not? That, those are great questions. So um, I'll answer the, the second question first. Um, the videos are still compatible because we haven't changed any of the fallacies. The, the, the conversations, um, they, they're all still relevant and the fallacies map just fine. We haven't changed the lesson order or the chapter number or anything like that. They're not teaching videos, they're kind of discussion videos. It's sort of, it's a video that sort of simulates what a classroom discussion might be like for these fallacies. So that if you are teaching at home and it's just you and your kid, um, or, I, and I hope this isn't the case, but if your student's kind of learning on his or her own, that then you could sort of watch what a classroom full of seventh and eighth grade students, what how they kind of navigate through these conversations with their teachers. So again, it's not a teaching video, but it's sort of an example video. Um, will we make a new video? 
I am 20 years younger in the video. So um, I look super cute and um, I'm young and, and lovely. So there's there's a vanity to uh, keeping the old video, but no, uh, seriously, uh, at some point we are going to have to create a new video. Um, and uh, and I, I, I'm, I might not be on the video in the, in the next one, which would be fine. Uh, but eventually we probably will make a new video, but because it is still compatible with the new text, it didn't necessitate that we do that right away. So. Um, maybe on that, but yes, you can certainly keep using it now. Awesome. And we'll just do another quick one or two, and then we can wrap up pretty soon. Um, we have one here uh, that says, asks if we have linked the fallacies with intellectual vices or combating them with intellectual virtues. And he gives an example. This is Carl Summer, by the way. Um, he gives an example, like saying, linking straw man to integrity, if that's um, something frequently done in the books or in videos. So that is a that's a really great idea. No, we didn't do that. Um, I I think that would be so much fun though. If Carl, if you went through and identified what intellectual vices and virtues you sort of saw um, layered there, I would love to uh, put that up on the website as a resource for folks. Um, I think that that might be a lot of fun. You know, we take a look at it and just make sure we would kind of confirm that we agree with your assessment, all those all of those things. But I think that's a that's a, a really great idea. Idea. Um, the fallacy flashcards, um, we've actually turned them into, so they're flashcards and more. Um, the, we've, we've turned them into, so there's four cardinal virtues, right? Justice, prudence, fortitude, and uh, temperance. And, um, and we have gone through and created playing cards uh, with them instead of this, the regular suits of hearts and diamonds and clubs and what's the other one? Hearts, diamonds, clubs, spades. Um, that was going to bother me. Um, now we have the four powder virtues as our suits and that kind of thing. So there, and there's a description about what the virtues are and and um, and why why the four cardinal virtues are so important. That kind of thing. So we are kind of dipping our toe into that way. Um, it, you know, towards that and making sure that we are kind of um, um, encouraging folks to be thinking about how to develop. Um, the intellectual and moral virtues uh, and the cardinal virtues in the work that they're doing, but that sounds like a really fun project and I would love to see it. Awesome. And the last one came from the chat box early on. So as we were discussing um, creating definitions, Kitty Paul wanted to ask if this is a skill practiced in the book or just um, instructed on identifying and um, Did you repeat the are they able to practice? Oops, sorry? Did you repeat the first part of the, the um on the topic of this came during um the section talking about definitions kitty paul wanted to know if they were practicing the skill as opposed to just learning about it oh I'm yes. sorry I wasn't sure there. um absolutely so ev in every single lesson um that is one of the things that we are encouraging you to do is have your students memorize a definition and then in the review exercises at the end of every lesson there is, you know, define your terms um, and as part of the practice and review. So you can certainly do those together for the first, you know, as you're introducing fallacies and then have your students kind of learning to build their own, uh, um, build their own definitions and that kind of thing. So yeah, but that is something that not only do we say, this is a really great idea, but it's actually a requirement for every single fallacy throughout the text. Amazing. Thank you so much. And thank you to everybody who asked questions. If we didn't get to yours, we will send you an email with some more information talking about um, what you're asking here. And if I can just share my screen very quickly, then I will um, just give you some uh, more information on some fun things to come and some other things that might be of interest to you. So I will go ahead and share that with you here. Let's see here. So um, first, repointing you back to the site that Joelle showed you during her talk, artofargument.com. This will um, give you some access to some more of the games that she showed you and some more information on each of the fallacies. Um, so even thinking about um, parents who were talking about wanting some more resources, this could be a good resource here for you as well. Uh, so just wanted to share this with you again here. Um, and then... For the rest of this week through the end of Friday, June 30th, all logic books are 20% off. So that includes Art of Argument, Discovery of Deduction, 
um, carrying on through there. Um, so if you use the code LOGIC20, um, that will give you access to that discount. So I wanted to share this with you here. And then with some other exciting things coming up at CAP here for you, um, we wanted to highlight for you Classical U. So if you are a teacher who is looking to better understand um, classical methods or just um, learn some more about different topics you're interested in teaching, um, go to Classical U and it's um, it will give you some more videos and classes on um, how to enhance those skills there for you. And there are a few that will focus more on logic. So if that is of particular interest to you, uh, this will be a good resource for you. And the other here is Scully Academy. Uh, so Scully Academy is for homeschool students who are interested in doing further classes with tutors. Um, so we have some that are also on logic if that's your specific interest, but there's plenty more courses there for you in different topics and enrollment for fall 2023 is open at scolaacademy.com. And then finally, if you are interested in building upon logic and getting into rhetoric, here you can find uh, writing in rhetoric, which is a related series here. Um, so we will also be having a webinar on this on July 7th, so upcoming in the next week or so. Uh, so keep an eye out for that. We will be posting more information about that, but um, just a related title if you are interested in logic here. So um, so that's all from us. I'll just go back here and um, highlight the discount code for you as well in case you didn't get to peek at it. Just a, one, two final things. I just saw um, a comment from Lourdes Velandia. I don't know if that's, um, she, was, she said, I wish I would have had this book before my um, before I got married. My husband says that our marriage changed as soon as I started writing the logic textbook. So um, anyway, so you're not alone. It will change your marriage as well. Um, and then just one other thing, I was looking at the, the question in here that's asked, like, are there plans to update the videos? I noticed it was plural, um, and I was only answering this, the question about updating videos for the Art of Argument. The Discovery of Deduction video has been just done. Um, it looks like it's old because I had my gray hair when I did it, um, and I have started coloring again, again, vanity. Um, but... Um, but uh, the video for the discovery of deduction is updated and it is a teaching video and it's it's all set and ready to go. It's just that the art of argument video is the one that's about 20 years old, maybe 15. Um, and, um, and that one we're not planning to update, but the discovery of deduction video is two years old and it's, it's all set up as a teaching video for the discovery of deduction. So I just wanted to make sure that was clear. Perfect. Sounds great. And uh, a reminder, if you have questions that we didn't get to answer, feel free to put your email in the chat or you can email us at the Ask the Magister box in on the site. That will also go to Joelle if it is questions about the art of argument. And there will also be a recording coming out. It will be emailed to you on Tuesday. So just keep an eye out for that. And it's been nice to see all of you. Thank you so much for your talk. And um, we'll see you all next time.